I misunderstood you. I thought you said it was going to be a time movie with a cameo by you, but instead it's going to be a Prince movie I with a cameo by the time. The sequel was Purple Rain. Suburban Chanhassen, Minnesota may soon become world famous for music and video. It is the site of Princess Paisley Park Media Complex, where homegrown music is being made in three recording studios, and where feature films and music videos are being made in a giant soundstage. And the studios at Paisley Park are state-of-the-art. The setup will accommodate motion picture filming and production of commercials in addition to music recording. So we've shot one video here. It's offered us anything that L.A. or New York has. It's probably the finest uh, soundstage in the country right now. Well, people like Prince, Sheila E., and maybe also some members of the time are going to be there. Well, they're planning to do all this, Daryl, but do they actually have commitments right now? So they do have a lot of commitment from a lot of big names. Now, this is the first time a lot of people have gotten a chance to take the tour of the studio, and I have to point out it is extremely impressive. This is not going to be just a music studio. They are also planning to make feature-length motion pictures here. Stars. The original script for Graffiti Bridge was me, Prince, and Madonna. And uh, Prince flew Madonna out to pay for the part. Either originally we were going to do a musical together, and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. Uh, and we'd gotten together a couple of times, you know, in the hopes of working with each other. And some Madonna didn't like the script, and Prince was telling her, well, I'm still writing it. They started arguing, and then they start ragging on each other. He, I, he seemed to fight the idea of just writing songs for a record together, because he's done that with so many people. Well, Madonna said the script sucks. Madonna drove Prince crazy, and they were arguing and talking about the script. Then they started talking about each other's shoes. Prince, look at your shoes, with cowboy boot shoes. Then she goes, Prince, look at your shoes with those peace signs and zippers and shoes. Two big egos. You know what I mean? We just kept getting together. And so Madonna said to Prince, I'm going to leave. It's too cold in Minneapolis. Sad because Prince had planned it, a party for Madonna. But Madonna was ready to go. But what Prince decided to do was like, let's have dinner. Prince's chef made food for Madonna and Prince. When Madonna got there, she saw all these candles. And she said, what are we having a seance or something? And they never ate the food. And then she told Prince that she wanted to leave. But before she left, they recorded that song, Like a Prayer, and it was another song they recorded together. And Love Song was one of the songs, and I just said, you know, this is crazy. It's such a great song. Why why not put it on the record? And um, it seemed to relate, just because it's about a relationship that that's, you know, a hate-love relationship. And so he agreed to it, and we kind of sent the tapes back and forth to each other, and we keep building it. It was like he would write a sentence, and... I would add on to it and then send it back to him and he would continue the story, you know, basically. It was fun. And then she left. I think that um, Prince lives a very isolated life and I don't and that is the big difference between us and I just try to be a positive influence on him. I've always been a fan. I think he's incredible and I also admire him. He's very courageous and he causes lots of controversy too, which is great and I think he is a brilliant musician. <laughs> Interesting. Well, we'll look forward to hearing from you tonight at 10. Maybe you can talk to Prince. When I was 15, that's the first time I met him. At Wembley Stadium in London when I was 15, I went to the show just by chance, met him after the show. I was there VIP because I was a little bit known and in the music business, went to the concert and then afterwards I met him mm. backstage. And we just spoke and, you know, had a nice conversation, nothing, nothing else. And then when I was 17, then I bumped into him, and uh, that's when like, we started a relationship. He had these questions in his heart and his mind, I think, and the night that I met him, he felt like there was a sign. And Yeah, the sign was, don't put out that shit to send the uh, only good rappers are dead rappers. <laughs> he wrote the nasty songs, and then he wrote songs that make you praise the Lord. And that's what he did, and it worked. Now, us that know that, we ain't going for that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is Morris Day. He used to live in Minneapolis. Now he lives in Minnesota. I'm getting ready to move out to this raggedy. And we, raggedy, and see, we would have been neighbors and things, but he moved in my neighborhood after, after I moved. he left. Or else I would have stayed and things. Because it couldn't be two stars in the actually, same neighborhood. But actually, there could have been, you know. Yeah, but but see, then we'd always been buying bigger cars. Buy bigger I'll do cars. the other one, see. I'll do the other one. We'd be you broke. Know, we'd be broke.
I'm broke now because I'm still in Minneapolis, so I got to move out here to make some money. And I'm broke because I'm out here and it's expensive to live out here, see? And we go. The sedition of the Midnight Funk Association is now being called to water. Hello, Prince. Hello, Detroit. Uh, speaking of uh, Jerome Benton, you've always maintained contact with people who've uh, flown under the wings of Prince. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, there, you know, there's people that have uh, uh, flown the coop, so to speak, and gone off to do their own thing, which is great. And I stand behind them and support, support them, whatever they do. You've been working with Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam. Mm -hmm. what, what's that like? I was there for a month and a half. It took us two weeks to complete the album. The rest of the time we fooled around and had a lot of fun. They're, they're perfectionists. I read somewhere that you were going to do a movie with The Time. They're, they're writing the screenplay right now. You're going to be doing a movie with the original Time members and Janet Jackson. Um, could you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, what I can tell you is that that's... Um, hopefully going to be in 1988. We we're shooting for 1987 and everybody's schedules got so caught up that it doesn't look like we're going to make it. But uh, we are planning on still doing it. Uh, it's just going to take a little longer than we thought. But we're looking forward to doing it. So hopefully it will happen. Do you think that there's a possibility that, that well I've you know just heard rumors through the grapevine that, that there's a possibility that the time was going to record again? Well Mojo, anything's possible. Yeah. Um, God willing and Hopefully everybody's head will be in the right place. I'd like to see all that happen. Uh, contrary to rumors, we're, we're all real tight still. And I have a strange feeling we're all going to be together again one day. We'll have to see. Remember, he had our attention because of his success. When you got somebody that's that intense, that successful, um, yeah, things go wrong, but he could correct it as well. Certain things happen, everybody fell apart, but... I still love all those guys and I hope they get back together because um, I want some competition, you know? <laughs> you know, a lot of groups split up and all the time. I think it should be a lot of this, especially when it's somebody like the kind. We've been talking about the union for a year now. Prince, Prince couldn't be here tonight, but he would like to say thank you very much to all his fans, and he loves you very much. Thank you. It didn't kind of hurt my feelings because I really looked up to her, but I could see where this was going. On that song, Rotic City, when she passes me, whispers some bullshit in my ear, she said to me, don't be touching my man. I went backstage, I tore up the dressing room. See, she went and told Prince what I did. Prince summons me to his hotel room. And I said, oh, pfft, I might as well go. I see you guys talked already. I got up to leave and slammed the door. Prince told me to come back in. I came back. He says to Sheila, did you say that? And she said, no, I didn't say that. I said, okay, I'm out of here. He said, Sheila, I'm not your man. I never was, and I never will be. And I went, boom, got up and walked out. All of this other stuff, it gets to be too much. And I'm like, I'm not enjoying myself. I wasn't treated very well by her. I think that's why I danced so hard, because I was angry. Love Sexy had not been as successful as he had wanted it to be. It was kind of a weird record that people didn't understand. Great tour, but the album wasn't what he thought it should have been. When I was 17, I moved to Minneapolis. I spent my birthday in England at home. I flew to Minneapolis the same day. So it was still the 31st because of the time difference. So I spent basically the morning of my birthday at home, the day on the plane and the evening in Minneapolis. And we worked together on songs. But the original movie was about me, Madonna and Prince. The whole script took another turn. When he first got that script, there was going to be a part for me. We were kind of laying in bed and he was reading it to me. <laughs> While we on tour, Love Sexy Tour, Prince was writing that script, all that music. 
I was kind of looking forward to Graffiti Bridge. You spend a whole year damn near on the road um, with a tour that you're unhappy with, with an album that you're unhappy with, and the relationship with the managers has become fractured. That's when he fired his managers, Cavallo, Ruffalo, and Farnoli. It was on New Year's Eve. Announced New Year's Day. He had appointed Al Magnoli as his new manager, and Magnoli was the film director. So it was insane. Dick. We were supposed to be working on Graffiti Bridge. We had a break. Prince was offered to do the music for the Batman movie, and he was working on that. He put me and Sheila E. on a retainer. Being on a retainer, I was doing other work. You know, until he finished the Batman movie. Sheila E. told Prince about us. Uh, yeah, I guess she was scouting. <laughs> Romeo Blue. That's that Romeo Blue phase. Oh, the thing on Soul Train? So I did that show. That was just for Soul Train. I was making my demos at a and A lot of the gear that it takes to make the record sound like what we want it to sound like, it's very hard to find. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking for a certain sound, mm -hmm. real whole, pure sound. Tony and I went to junior high school together. His name was Tony Fortier. Tony was the partner I'd been looking for. I hadn't seen him in a few years. He'd grown his hair out and looked like a rock star. We started making music together and he was kind of on this thing. It was funky. Tony was raw. If I played you these demos, I mean, they were nasty, nasty funk. It was like where I went with Let Love Rule, but it was more on the funk side. And I was playing a lot of his instruments on demos. We were working on material that featured him. There was always an undercurrent of competition coming from Tony. Then came Sonia. Sonia was irresistible. She met Tony. Tony and Sonia hopped on his bike to grab food. But they didn't return that night. I didn't think in a million years that Tony would steal my girl. But he did. I was heartbroken. Tony and I stuck together. I hung in with him. We did a showcase. Well, somewhere in the valley. I played bass. Tony sang lead. We did the showcase. For, I guess Prince sent Sheila. Prince signed Tony, who wanted me to be part of the deal. Remember Tony telling me that Prince said that they didn't sound like records to him. He wanted them to be more polished. They ended up signing. I went my own way to go do my stuff. I turned it down. Is Tony, is that how you met Ingrid Chavez? Because they, they were dating at one point, weren't they? That Tony and Prince had a falling out because of yeah, over her. Yeah, the, I, I, yeah, I don't want to speak for her, but yeah. So there was like about a year and a half time between us recording the original tracks for the poetry album and finishing the album. Tony and I became really close. We were boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, being there, we would all hang out and we would go to the studio late at night and do background vocals or on his record. And, but it wasn't like Prince was involved with my life at the time. That was just an interesting period in time. Tony Lebronsky, that may have been the first project we had when I took the label over. Good question. Either Farnoli or Cavallo brought them to the label. Good question came out earlier. Inevitably, it was up to Prince what records we submitted for release. Now, Warners could say no, but they didn't. Any finished album that we gave them, they released. At one point, for me, the music started changing, and I just didn't like what he was doing. It's like, I, I got to take a break. I want to do something else. You know? So, I, and I like playing with other artists as well. I wanted to play with other artists, and especially, right. you know, you have a bucket list and you dream. I want to play with so-and-so, and one day I get to meet this person, that person. And that's all I wanted to do, and so and that's what I did. I wanted to play with other people. And Prince said, um, I heard that Stephen Farnoli is still your manager. And I go, yeah. And then he goes, well, you know, that shit ain't going to work, don't you? And I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, fire him, or we're not going to work together anymore. And he hung up the phone on me. I remember a week later, he called me, so did you fire him? And I said, no, I didn't. And he said, well, you know, we can't work together anymore. I said, oh, well, I guess we can't. I hung up the phone. And that's how me and Prince's relationship ended. He wanted me to fire Stephen Bagnoli because he fired him. Madonna dropped out. Then the thing with me and Stephen, everything turned into chaos. I had then just recorded the song Fantasia Erotica. There was a part in the script where there's a girl group who were also going to be valet parking the cars, like right. from the club. Mm -hmm. So they were going to be valet parking, which was going to be me and two girls that I brought for Fantasia Erotica. Fantasia Erotica, Prince and I sat at Paisley Park. We were writing, you know, the lyrics to the song. And the Fantasia Erotica, we specifically did for me. And he was like, wow, you should put a girl group together. So I picked two friends from Europe. I went over there. We filmed this thing. Do you have a copy of Fantasia Erotica? Yes. Yeah. Get a video camera and you two do a routine to it. 
like an audition for them, sent it back, and he was like, okay, and he was like, all right, that's fine. But he's seen it. Isn't it funny? I did it Then there was going to be a part where we go into the club and we sing. And there were a lot of other changes, which I heard from Jill Jones. She's actually in it. When Kim Basinger was involved, it was something else. <laughs> yeah. And she apparently had written this story of the angels. I do remember meeting him for the first time in the back cave. You know, he kind of actually fit, you know, when, I, when he walked in. It was kind of funny. You know, I was there when he wrote the whole Batman album. He gave me this cassette and that it just said Anna Waiting. The song Anna Waiting was written specifically for my birthday. Then we went in the car and he put the cassette in and that was the first time I heard that song. And the lyrics in the song, most of it is are things that literally happened or things that we talked about throughout the whole song. It's like a whole story. I loved the song, it was great the first time I heard it. And then it was actually a couple of months later, he was in the studio doing the Batman album. With it. That was a huge hit. Vicky Vale. He said, would you mind if I use the song Anna Waiting on the Batman album? The thing is, all the songs are as if the songs were conversations to each other. Batman to Vicky, Vicky to Batman. Kim luckily came in last minute. It was kind of, a, I think, probably a strange circumstance for her because she's last minute th thrown into this sort of boys club, you know, <laughs> all these guys, you know, where's the girl, you know. There was a bit of a power struggle over Kim Basinger's affection. So Michael Keaton started to pursue Kim Basinger. She ended up landing in John Peter's bed. That made Michael Keaton mad because, I mean, of course, she's Batman. But John Peter was the producer. She ended up in a row fanatical romance with the purple one himself, Prince. The song Bat Dance apparently gets her rolling. She moved to Minneapolis to be with him. She moves to Minneapolis to freaking Paisley Park. Paisley Park! Stop the press. I mean, she showed up with that crazy looking dress at the Oscars. She was in. She was all in. Because Kim was cool with me. I was wearing a dress, this big old dress. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I had to sort of fit back in the audience after that. Nobody would look up at me because I got the hook. I literally did. They said, I don't know what's going on, but they, you know, it went. Wow. During my whole thing. So, no, it wasn't how I felt. I just, it just, I felt, yeah. you know, yeah. sometimes you just, there's something in your gut that just says, you got to get up and you got to do it. You got to go. It's the biggest truth of all, and let's do the right thing. But there is oh, one film missing God. from this list that deserves to be on it. It might tell the biggest truth of all, and that's do the right thing. And I had a really nice part between me and Kim. It was ace. And we were both around the same height, kind of. So it wasn't even like a bat. I didn't have to... No one had to stand on a box next to me. It was kind of nice for a change. <laughs> and it's crazy too, because when we came in to do the music, mm -hmm. he was there, but there was no mention of a movie. The original script was with Kim Basinger. She was supposed to be directing. She was, she was coming around Paisley quite a bit. 
after that party man video too. I noticed like they didn't speak to her first and, and if they responded to her it was short. They didn't really make any kind of eye contact. I'm going to the, one of the bathrooms on the on the main level. We're out there recording one night and I turned the corner from the uh stairwell. And she's there. You know, I was I was petrified. And and we almost run into each other. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And she's like, oh, wow. no, 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 I'm, I know you guys are used to people creeping around here at this time of night. You're an incredible drummer. Somebody's so young, she's talking. I'm just like, I need to get away because I, I mean, I'm the youngest and I'm the last one hired. He's a very, 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 very surprising guy. Yeah, I'm, I think he's some, something else. Like I remember Kim sitting there a few times, sitting in the studio with us. She sings. She's, I don't know if she's a singer. But she sings. She fancied herself to be a singer. That she did do some recording with Prince out there. Mm -hmm. The first time I heard her singing was actually on a version of a song called Soul Psychedelicide. And then he tried the Kim Basinger singer. That probably is what sealed the deal with Kim Basinger. <laughs> okay. Wait. What? Wait a minute. Yes. She's on the rise to stardom. She's just done the biggest blockbuster ever in history. And she moves away from Hollywood? She moves to Minneapolis. There's a song on that soundtrack called Scandalous. They have an extended version of Scandalous where Kim Basinger and Prince can be heard trysting in the studio. Trysting? Trysting. And Kim Basinger is singing on it. She's rapping. She's rapping. She's rapping. Kim Basinger is rapping. Yeah, she this is something I got to <laughs> She was delightful, man. Bradford Marcellus was playing at the Fine Line, that's a club in Minneapolis. Prince and Kim Basinger came in and they went into the upper mezzanine and, and took a table. They may have had a few like pre-gig cocktails. They might have had some champagne on the way either on the, on the way down or maybe at Paisley before they came down to the show. So, they were a little giggly. Prince reached over to grab something and he knocked her champagne, knocked her glass over, and it all ran right into her into her lap. And Prince was so, so mortified. And she was like, hey, it's no big deal. She was, she didn't care. He was a little bit embarrassed. It's it's hard to find to, to see Prince kind of out of his element. He goes, Kim's not uh directing it anymore. I was like, what happened? What did you do? We were on the phone. I was like, what did you do? He goes, What do you mean what did I said, what did you do? Because you did something. You knew he did something. <laughs> yeah. And it was because somebody answered the phone at the house. That's funny. Who shouldn't have been. And Kim just sent her people and took her stuff and was gone. Then Kim mm -hmm. and they didn't split so nicely. When Kim mm -hmm. left, she took her shit. She, she took her stuff because she was supposed to be directing. That's what, see, the thing is, we'd mm -hmm. already signed on. It's I crazy. knew there was a movie because when he told me Kim was out, mm -hmm. we had words. And I was like, what did you do? I just went, what did you do? I got to give her a lot of respect for it. And so it's kind of yeah. like, nope. And I don't blame her. That's and funny. she took the script. So the script was actually quite almost like Vim Vendors esque It was like um, the first film with the angels, which was so cool. And then it changed. That's it was very cool. Like I was Electra in it. Everybody was different, but I didn't. Then, uh, then I just became Jill again. And then it just turned back into like a, he couldn't use stuff that Kim Basinger and him had written before. That was her intellectual property too. Uh, Kim Basinger was around like his, like his girlfriend and she was in the script. When we came in to do the music, mm -hmm. he was there, but there was no mention of a movie. When I went back home, that's when he called and dropped the idea that, you know, we got a film we're going to do. It's going to be great. And, you know, because he was Prince, he could sleep whenever he wanted. He could do whatever he wanted. And what he wanted to do was like work and play with girls. And that's really all he did at that <laughs> era of his life. Like he would literally order them out of magazines. Like if he saw a model in a perfume ad, he would go up to Therese and say, find her, like send her here. I don't, I don't know how it worked, but like these girls would just show up. He would have a different hot woman with him, you know, all the time. And sometimes he'd have a kind of a girlfriend for a little while, but for the most part, it was just kind of like someone new all the time. But mainly he would, they would, he would pick them up and go to the club and do whatever, and then come back to the studio like two, three, four in the morning and we'd start working again. Another thing with the time for yeah. me. We got plenty of ground to cover. We say whatever, we do whatever. Friends talk about friends truly. That's right. Free, yes. yes. Prince is our friend. That's we it. love Prince. We were kicked out by the royal hoof, hoof, pump, pump, whatever, of Prince. And, uh, but like I said, it was a business thing. We're best of friends now. That's right. Prince, we love you, man. Yeah. It's long before I was a 
producer, I was just a musician. That's all I did. You used to work for PR in production. I used that to was, work for PR, was... which is Paisley Park now. Actually, you know, I've worked with Prince. We did the controversy tour with Prince, which was supposed to go overseas. He said, I don't want to get my ass kicked overseas. Then the 1999 tour, once again, we were supposed to go overseas. We had our passports, everything ready to go. Once again, ass kicking. We didn't even play New York and LA. Ass kicking was getting so bad. So, we didn't make it overseas. I was a roadie for the time. Was a valet for the time. A bodyguard for the time. A bodyguard? Right. No, you took the mirror off the wall then. A mirror man for the, the time. Mirror man. I went from the side of the stage onto the stage. Onto the, the time. stage. And onto the album cover. And onto the album cover. The first Alexander O'Neill record we did took six months to do. The Hearsay album only took like three months to do. Oh, Alex, yeah, I'll be back in the States, man. I, I'm just finishing up this interview, man. I personally got kicked out the band for producing other acts. After that happened, the group proceeded to record the Ice Cream Castles LP. Full fledged. The Ice Cream Castles. I went to do Purple Rain. And we, uh, you know, things were feeling different. We had lost, you know, two of our, our key members, and uh, the group just didn't feel the same anymore. You know, we lost two of our members. I was ready to go. Jesse Johnson, our guitarist, landed a solo deal, and after that I was like, it's time to go. Because Morris Day had to do what Morris Day does best. Personally, didn't see any other avenue for me to go. I don't think that then people could accept Morris Day trying to be a balladeer. From Purple Rain to a group called The Family. Prince and the Revolution. Prince and Revolution. I did Under the Cherry Moon. But you know what I liked about that movie? Me. You. From Under the Cherry Moon, on to my, do my solo career. From there, with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis production. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis production. Dancing with that one girl. Control. That Jackson girl. Now people working with me recognizes those talents, so they, they pay for them. I have no ego. I know exactly who I am. Oh, oh, you know who you are. And now the time's back together. Now you can really do what you now want. Now I can really do what I want. He was not happy that I signed at Warner's. And it was his managers that were able to negotiate that. Even though Prince called me and said he liked the album, he liked the song Since I Fell For You, it didn't do very well because he's upset. But I think he wanted me to be on girl songs. And he wanted me to stay in Minnesota. And the fact that I went separate on my own with the same record label, with the same managers, I think upset him. So I finally went to Mo Austin and I said, he's the money maker here. You know you're not doing anything for me. Let me go. And I asked him to release me from my contract. I had a seven-year contract. And he let me go. I have still music in Spanish at Warner's. I walked out of there with boxes of all my material and didn't look back. Yeah, you know, there's people that have flown the coop, so to speak, gone off to do their own thing, which is great. And I stand behind them and support, support them, whatever they do. But uh, contrary to rumors, we're, we're all real tight still. I have a strange feeling we're all going to be together again. I want some competition, you know? We did a great movie together you, called uh, Graffiti Bridge. And we, we were had a great, great dramatic actors in, in our, our own right. right. The sequel it was Purple Rain. Right? Supposedly, but not. Do you remember Purple Rain and the comparison of tapes that were done between certain person and for the same scene? When Kim Basinger was involved, it was something else. Yeah. And she apparently had written this story of the angels. So it had the whole thought concept of like angels. And then when they had their little thing, it went away. That's somebody else's property. So he had to rewrite it. He ended up with this other thing. She and her co-star are still what Hollywood calls an item. I'm going to get kicked if I don't ask you about Alec Baldwin. What do you want to know? Are you nuts about each other? We're nuts about each other. That's uh, funny. You're nuts about him? Yep. So something good came out of the marrying man. Huh? Oh, that's what it's all about. Because she was supposed to be directing. See, it's everything's timing. There was a reason for the marrying man, and I guess that was it. I got to give her a lot of respect for it. So it's kind of yeah. like, nope, and I don't blame her. That's and funny. she took the scripts. These in the temple. I said, it's a piece of shit to him. And he says, no, it's not. It's a Wizard of Oz. I said, no, it's not. I said, that's a classic. My lawyers, that if there was a sequel, that I would get points and there was a big, you know, a monster salary. And I said, well, I get a producer's credit. I get points. He goes, no. He says, your salary? He goes, we can't pay you. We can't pay you. He goes, he goes you just do the movie and we pay you what we pay you. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, I didn't see it as a sequel at all. You know, all those elements create something that's going to be successful. You know, Purple Rain, everything was a little more open. 
but structure. Um, well, you know, and I mean, you have William Blinn, you know, who knows story structure for Purple Rains. And I didn't, you know, I was only peripherally aware of all this, but then one day Kim was gone and Ingrid was there. He kept this project real close to his chest. There wasn't a lot of input that we could do. Albert ran his show a whole different way. Yeah, see, the thing is, is that, you know, there's one thing about the individual and there's another thing about the persona of the, of the individual through the press. The thing is, is that Prince and his team realized very quickly that they were truly entering a new medium. And there was never any discussion about, well, we have to do this and we have to do this. I pitched the project. They, they said, yes, you know, Prince said, man, I trust you. Let's just, you know, let's go. I wrote the script in 21 days in a hotel room after doing like three weeks of research with the whole Minneapolis group. We're making this. we got to do it this way. This is the way the costumes have to look. This is the way the lighting is. Here we go. Rock and roll films had not been very successful in Hollywood up to that point. Um, for some reason, they just were not working. I think I know why they're not working, and this is how we have to approach it to ensure that this one does work. Because, you know, it's a hard thing to make a film, and it's it's incredibly difficult, and there's really very little time to have a discussion about who's, like, going to pull the string. And there is no reason to even get involved in a project unless you know who's pulling the strings. The things that had made him successful in the music world were not translatable into the film world. There is no difference. There have been people that have tried to tell me contrary to that, but when, like I said before, um, I strive for perfection, and uh, sometimes I'm a little bullheaded in my ways. Uh, hopefully, uh, people understand that there's just a lot on my mind, and I try to stay focused on one particular thing. And I try not to hurt nobody in the process. The movie, movie's a little bit more complex but to me it's just a larger version of an album there are scenes and there are songs and they all go together to make this painting guess what we're all going to go see purple rain tonight i've seen it too many times but i want to watch it again right after we finished doing corporate world i went home back to los angeles he called me a few days later said i got a movie i'm writing the time got back together to do an album called Pandemonium. After the time was together doing the album Pandemonium, a certain phone call happened. And that phone call, hey, the phone. Hello? Oh, hi, Prince. How are you? What are you up to, sir? I want to know if you guys would uh, like to be in a film starring the time. Oh, being a film starring the time, Prince? Yes, um, we're going to write uh, like kind of documentary how you guys got together and things you guys been through with. Uh, oh, in other words, it's going to be like our story, kind of like uh, Purple Rain was going to be your story, right? Yes, exactly. I'm, I'm just going to have a cameo appearance in the, in the movie. Oh, it's going to be just a, a time movie with a cameo appearance by yourself. Prince, exactly. a cameo appearance. He's yeah, changed. He's yeah, different. he's changed. He's right? different. Okay. Cool, Are man. You guys in? Send it right over, Prince. That sounds great, man. Awesome. Yeah. My messenger. One week later. Hey, y'all, the script got here from Prince about the time of the Hey, man, look at here. Prince rides his motorcycle. Prince gets the girl. Prince writes a song. Prince, Prince. Turn hey, page, man. Hey, man, what's the time, man? I don't see my name, man. Here's the time page right here. Here's this time. What page is that? The 50? time script, man. Time, page 50, okay. man. Here's oh, our first man. line, man. Yeah. Hey, Prince, man, I thought this was going to be a... What happened? Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, so it's going to be... Oh, I, I, th I misunderstood you. I thought you said it was going to be a time movie with a cameo by you, but instead it's going to be a Prince movie I'll with a cameo you. by the time. I'll call you guys back when I finish the script. Oh, okay, thanks, Prince. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's so that's the way that's the way that, that little story went down. That's it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any idea how the film is going to come out? Absolutely fabulous. I don't think I was very intimately involved with that time record. No. He didn't need the time there in order to work on the time record. I only met Morris Day once. And with Prince's new film, Graffiti Bridge, brings back some of the characters from Purple Rain. With Prince for the second time around are Morris Day and Jerome Benton, and here they are. Did Prince get a little envious when he sees you like this? Maybe Prince will be clean as me one day. Uh, this is early in the morning for me. I don't start looking good till afternoon. <laughs> Morris is really good in this. Like, he's a good actor. Prince knew his humor, knew his timing. He knew Morris. Everybody can't write for Morris. A lot of people, they overwrite. You know, anything he wanted to do, I was down for. I was all in. This would be my third project with him in front of the camera. So I was like, okay, let's go. Let's do this. 
and you know he's really into it but that was the last call i got the input for this movie was cut off we were just all invited well let's see i had met prince a few years earlier i had made this record with him that hadn't been released this is a few years later and you know we actually wound up not talking for a couple of years after that and then sitting together and finishing the record and then making a movie i think that it was because of you that i got the part in graffiti bridge ingrid and i well we go back prince said i know this girl you should actually meet her she's a real poet she's really the real deal and go meet her talk to her and then come back and tell me what you think and so we met you were living off of Nicollet Avenue on like the third floor or something like this and I mean usually he was looking for radio friendly kind of people who had that and she was really a poet and an, and an artist and which was not typical of, of the artist that he was looking at and so I came back and I said you know yeah she's the real deal. I got a call from Prince he asked me if I wanted to finish the poetry album which we start working on the poetry album we start making videos and Craig Rice shot the first video, Heaven Must Be Near. Heaven Must Be Near, I shot that, I directed that and shot the video, which Prince actually edited, which I thought he did a great job. It took too long, but he, <laughs> did, he did a great job. But when they went to start looking for a lead for the role of Aura, Craig told Prince, you have Aura here, like, why are you looking anywhere else, so. When we got to Graffiti Bridge, I said, we need to put her in the movie. When they first began to conceptualize Graffiti Bridge, I think that these were the characters the original script for Graffiti Bridge was me, Prince, and Madonna. Originally, we were going to do a musical together, and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. I was kind of looking forward to Graffiti Bridge, but Madonna dropped out, and then he got Ingrid and whoever else. Everything turned into chaos. I think Camille was going to be a character in the movie, but that was dropped. Instead of the character being named Angel, it was named Aura. And then Kim Basinger, she was in the script. Then one day, Kim was gone, and... Ingrid was there. I had never acted. I was nervous about it. The production started and they started telling me, you know, the parts. I had to eliminate all of the questions that were popping up for what was going on and just try to make it part of who I was. Prince just goes with things, you know. I, I think that people didn't understand where he was going with it while he was making it. And that might have, you know, influenced how it turned out. Yeah, it, it sort of evolved because, you know, they shot a lot of that movie at Paisley Park. Now, when Prince directs and writes and produces and stars in and all these things, does he get a little crazed uh, trying to do wear so many hats at once? What's it like to work with him? Uh, it's cool. You know, so I'd wander back and see what they were shooting. Doing it in the soundstage was a terrible idea. It just seemed really fakey and the script was dumb. But for the most part, I just was just in the studio doing like what we always did. And so he would work in the recording studio whenever he wasn't working on the movie set. Prince was rehearsing for the Batman tour. So he was running from studio to studio. I knew I should have brought you to Europe. I remember us meeting. A lot of people got backup dancers now. It's not something I ever really did, but maybe it's time to do something different. And Prince saying, like, what do you guys think? Should we take the show to this kind of situation? And Prince decided to hire them to go ahead and do it. That was really a turning point. What's up with this drum machine? What? Are you in charge here? Well, I said, oh, no, I'm not having that. So I walked over to him and I said, hey, look, man, if you want to talk to me, we can go to your office. And then he kind of looked at me and said, you about to do for an ass whooping. I looked around if his bodyguards was there. At Paisley, we, I mean, if we were there, we were doing something else. I didn't see them. I said, you mean you? So I laid the guitar on the floor. When we got towards the door, okay, come on, man, come on, come outside. It's a field over here. I'm getting ready to cut it all down with your ass. He looked at me. He opened the door and he said, get out of my building. I went home and I took a shower and I went to the discotheque. You know, I was in the discotheque dancing on the floor and when his uh, security dudes came. He sent me and Gilbert over to go talk to Miko and saying that he wanted to talk to him. So I went up to where he was sitting down somewhere. So I went over there and sat by him. Uh, so I said, hey, man, what are you screaming at me in front of these people and all that? Oh, you can't be handling me like that. And then he said, yeah, man, I know. I'm sorry, man. I've been under pressure with this film and the tour and all of that. I was just under a little bit too much pressure. And I said, well, now you have to pay. So you got to double my per diem and double my salary for this tour. And he was like, what? He said, man, a real musician wouldn't be wanting that money. And I go, oh, I'm so glad I'm not a real musician. You better pay me, fool. And then uh, that was it. 
no big deal. And then when I went on the tour and did the same. I didn't know about the Miko thing until we were at the club. Even before my record was released, I went into the studio with Minnie Kravitz and recorded Just By My Love. You saw it all over her. I'm standing next to her and I'm talking, have a full conversation. She was really nice, but I was like, maybe I'm bucking her. Eventually I walked away. I'm on stage shooting now a scene. And then I watch Prince walk over to her and she does the same thing. <laughs> she wasn't impressed by nothing any of us was well, doing. That's true. When I got back into the scene, I was kind of over it. You know, like, okay, I'm going to do this movie. Graffiti Bridge. You tell us about it. This is a nice movie. This movie is, um, you might want to call it a sequel to Purple Rain. Uh -huh. You know, Warner Brothers having some kind of input on, you know, like what they thought was going to make a good film or not. It wasn't, you know, sticking with what they originally had decided this film was going to be about. I think it came down to editing and Prince was changing the script along the way. Hasn't uh, this nightclub been Real left state. to you? Uh, in a will? Yeah, I'm trying to take the club from you. Well, you have different attitudes towards the way life should be lived. You're going to live for money, right? And the kid, well, there's a conflict there. But I think that it, he wanted to make a musical. It was just something he was trying to say, you know, about love and God and peace and people getting together and getting along, things like that. Sometimes his shooting day was different because he was always adding new stuff. Yep. My panty scene wasn't in the script. It was totally written then. <laughs> and we all were on set that day. We're hanging out in his bedroom. It's the night after he's taken me from Morris Day. It's the night scene. I'm still in the dress. We're talking about his sheet music. And suddenly, like, he's getting hung. <laughs> I think it was supposed to kind of come out of that part of the film. Yeah. Even when I was doing it, it just felt so dark and intense for the kind of film that he was making. A lot of beautiful women always circulating around Prince, you know. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> gets left on he was dating Elisa somewhere in the middle of all this, too. I was around a lot at that time in the studio. How I met Prince was I was working with David Z, who's produced The Fine Uncannibals and The Jets and Jody Watley. And I was working with him in Minneapolis at Paisley Park. And Prince walked in one day when I was in the bathroom. And I came back. Prince looked up and said, is that you singing? I said, yes. He said, go home, write some lyrics, bring them back tomorrow, and we'll write a song. So I did, and then he was impressed, and uh, he just stayed around. Well, a lot of things happened on Graffiti Bridge. The Love Machine was quite dirty. I really had no idea that Jill was on there before. I did some overdubs on this song in Prince's studio. She had initially been the one singing Love Machine. And I got asked to go into Studio B and, hey, Morris Day laid this track down and I want you to put your vocals. And I said, okay. He never told me. He was sneaky like that. He, he liked to play games. He uh -huh. let me sing it with my own vocal and then he put Elisa Fiorillo in them. When I heard that he did that, I was like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I guess because he couldn't put her in the movie, maybe he put her in there in a really weird way. I don't know what happened between them at the time, but something got, they got in a fight or something. That was a funny game that I'm sure she wasn't too happy about for a long time and probably thought it was my fault. That's how Prince was. Oh, I didn't want to do this scene. I just thought it was very exploitative. I did it, but I didn't want to. <laughs> but I had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it, Jill. <laughs> One thing he could do, he could find talent. He could if he just put people in things that they were good at. Sometimes he wanted us to be so good at things. And even I was like, I don't think that's good. It'd be hard to admit, like, uh, that take wasn't really good, Prince. Like, I don't think that's good. I'm we don't have time, Jill. We don't have time, Jill. <laughs> Now playing. Please check newspapers for a theater near you. Like it lacked all of the cool things of Purple Rain, which mm. was filmed on location, like wet streets and places, and, and mm. it has a realness about it. And well, we look forward to American. Um, uh, I mean, graffiti, graffiti, graffiti bridge. American graffiti. That's I was going to say. Uh, right. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's graffiti bridge, is <laughs> if you're looking for it. Yeah. But thanks so much for coming by. And <laughs> Okay. I relate very much to that character. She sort of has to be sacrificed at the end, sort of. Yes. It's just the feeling that it is a sacrifice. Writing and laying your soul on the line is a sacrifice. The story of my life. <laughs> I'll tell you how I met Lenny, filming Graffiti Bridge. And after finishing up work that day, Prince asked me if I wanted to go see Lenny play at First Avenue. He had a limo drive us to First Avenue and... We're just there hanging out and we hung out at the soundboard and watched for a little bit. It's halfway through Lenny's set and Prince is like, yeah, boy, let's go. I want to go home now. Lenny wasn't even done yet. So we get in the limo. We drive all the way back to Paisley Park 
at the time, I lived literally like five minutes from First Avenue. And he gets out of the car and he tells the driver to take me home. And I'm like, can you just take me back to First Avenue? So I went back to First Avenue and I went backstage. She came to some of my early gigs, but I don't remember the day that I met her. Like, was that a gig or was that a... Lindy and I had a mutual friend, Tony Lamas. Um, we met, I don't, I'm not sure if it was through Tony or just her coming to a gig. Um, yeah. I never met, met Lenny, but I was friends with Tony and I knew that him and Lenny were friends. So I just talked to Lenny and told him, you know, I'm a friend of Tony's. And so we talked and hung out for a little while and we became friends. So whenever I was out in LA, we would hang out. I had just come off the road from the Let Love Rule tour. I was nobody. I was the kid, new kid on the block. And when I would go out to LA for to pick up some of the shots for the movie, I would hang out with Lenny. And she was here shooting the movie and then we were in LA editing and mixing and all that for the movie. And then the song was written <laughs> a few months down the line when I was in Los Angeles. I sort of just booked myself in a studio just to do some things and it came out. <laughs> Him and Andre Betts were in the studio and he invited me to the studio and Zoe was just a little girl and I was coloring with her. Lenny Kravitz and myself and a guy named Andre Betts went in the studio. They asked me if I had anything. I said, I have this letter that I wrote on me. So I just went in and read the letter. Dre Betts started to beat, Lenny did some strings and I did all the vocal and, and the lyric. And then a couple of days later, Lenny invited me to go to Virgin to um, talk to the head of Virgin and let them hear this song. I had a cassette of the song. The head of Virgin asked me if he could have my copy. Oh, can, um, I really like this song. Can I, can I hold on to your cassette? Must have heard that this was a song Madonna should do, but can, can I have a copy? I was like, oh yeah, sure. Thinking I will get another copy. When I actually tried to contact the studio and talk, contact people about getting another copy, it was like shut down. <laughs> When I gave Justify My Love to Madonna, I called her and I said, I have a number one song for you. Unfortunately, he said that he did it all and me and Dre were sort of left out of the picture pretty much. And I brought it to her and she heard it and she liked it and we recorded it two days later. Lenny gives a song to Madonna. They record it without my permission. Oh, she's the one who uh, laid the track, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, we had our problems here and there. Lenny brought me a track with the lyrics written, and then I came in and changed the things that I wanted to change vocally or lyrically, and then did, you know, my version of it. When Lenny Kravitz brought me the song, I didn't know anything about yeah. the fact that he had worked with Ingrid Chavez. I mean, I was completely innocent in this situation. Boyhood chums with Prince from, uh, from Minneapolis? Yeah, we are. Yeah. So you knew Prince when he was just a, a little Prince, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, they, so Prince I, fascinates me. Mm. <laughs> it's a gag order. We can one go to find nice women. Oh, you got to get out and look. They ain't gonna just fall in your lap. As he saw me on TV, he had Paisley Park staff searching for me. The library at church is good girls. We are in Los Angeles, and Prince is taking us to his house from mm -hmm. Paradise 24. But that's where you messed up, son. You can't go to no bar to find a nice woman. We go to his house, and I give him my demo. He said, I like the lyrics. I like your rapping. I hate the music. I was a rapper. I was already in the studio. I had a demo, and I took it everywhere I went. I was trying to get on as an artist. You got to go to a nice place. The Black Awareness Rally, there's going to be some fine women there. Good, good, clean girls. Graffiti Bridge it wasn't my first movie. I was in Coming to America first. Love song. It's such a great song it's because it's about a relationship that's, you know, a hate love relationship. It seemed to relate. They had dated. Originally, we were going to do a musical together and we were going to write the music for it, and that didn't really pan out. Prince told me that he originally wanted Kim Basinger, but she turned it down. They broke up. She was supposed to be the lead in Graffiti Bridge. He gave it to Ingrid, who was also his previous girlfriend. Ingrid went out with my old friend Lenny Kravitz from high school. Tony and I went to junior high school together. His name was Tony Fortier. He'd grown his hair out and looked like a rock star. We started making music together. Prince signed Tony. Tony and I became really close. We were boyfriend and girlfriend. So it was just too much. It was like touching in so many areas. The song comes out. I haven't told anyone. And I've signed a non-disclosure. I've made an agreement with Lenny. You wrote Justify Your Love for, for Madonna. It was a collaboration between the two of us, and it, it sort of started off at my studio and ended up in hers. We, we worked really hard. And then all of a sudden it was like number one all over the world. It was kind of a shock. This is ABC News Nightline.
Reporting from New York, Forrest Sawyer. Has Madonna finally gone too far? Well, Come I back. only have a few minutes. Half of me thought that I was going to get away with it. The other half thought, you no, know, with the wave of conservatism that is sweeping over the nation, there was going to be a problem. A video is the filmic expression of the song. A woman is talking to her lover and she's saying, I'm not afraid of who you are. These feelings exist. There are a lot of people in the industry who have said it was all a kind of publicity stunt. This is one of the best self-marketers in the business. We have never really seen anything like it. MTV, they rejected it completely. Now, for the first time, the channel has decided to take a pass on a clip by pop music's hottest star. When we decided, hell, let's sell it. What Madonna did was brilliant. I admire her so much. I never got to communicate with her about the song ever. And I haven't spoken to her in years. When I met her, she was completely different than the music. So without knowing her now, I do not know her now. I can't really speak about her music without knowing how she really is. Where I kind of agreed that I wouldn't tell anyone that I wrote the song, so I didn't even tell Prince. Prince hears it on the radio, and he calls me up, and he says, uh, Ingrid, what's up with that Madonna song? I know that's you. I had never told anyone. It was just between me and Lenny. So I admitted to him on the phone. I was I was like, yeah, you're right. I recorded this song, and I, and I made an agreement with Lenny that I wouldn't tell anyone. He said, are you stupid? You have a record coming out and people are going to think that you are copying Madonna. I was so surprised that he could hear it so clearly that I had written that song, even though I had never told him. He was so mad at me. Prince himself spent the next hour and a half on stage at Parky Creek. Now, if you're a Prince fan, you have the opportunity of winning a complete set of Prince albums. All you have to do is answer these three questions. Who brought Prince to Cork? What is Prince's real name? And what is the name of the current tour? No, he's wrong. It's impossible to adequately describe the power of Prince in concert if you haven't experienced it. Well, as you know, it all began last December when tickets went on sale at 9 a.m. Many fans had queued overnight to guarantee themselves a place at the concert of the year. And for those, the wait was definitely all worth it. Already safe! This one's a much simpler production. Action on stage, and of course his songwriting is second to none. Uh, I'm using virtually every effect known to man. Uh, we're going to try to give you a good show tonight. You expect a lot of black people on stage this evening. Uh, number the party. Just a funky groove. Number the funky groove. 1999 had the whole place screaming along. The future. Housequake. Purple Rain, of course. Take me with you and stuff like that. Nothing compares to you. They brought the long set home with When Doves Cry. And I was crying too. When the stadium chanted and screamed him back on stage for an encore, he did Baby I'm a Star. Insane Latin rhythms and dance moves with spins and slides, which segued to Brother with a Purpose and Weak and Funk. I felt Daddy's grip on my elbow. Maite, do you hear that? This music, this is your music. You should be dancing to that, Mama shouted in my ear over the roar of the concert. He needs to see you dance. He flew me to see that concert. So I flew on a small plane with Rosie Gaines and Michael Bland and all those people. And we went to Ireland and I stood backstage and watched the concert with The Edge from U2. After Whoa, here comes a tour bus. Mama saw Prince and Rosie Gaines inside and she started to get excited. So I smiled up at the windows and waved. Prince told me that when he saw me standing there, he said to Rosie Gaines, there's my future wife. I saw her and her mother outside the concert in Frankfurt. And... Um, I said, that's my future wife. 
Really? I said when he told me. Yeah, I said, there's my future wife. And Rosie laughed. What made you say that, I wondered. And I still wonder. I don't know, he shrugged. I thought I was joking. <laughs> Just as, you know. After our meetup in Switzerland, Prince and the nude tour had moved to France, England, and Japan. 11 performances in 20 days before he went home to Minnesota. And of course, the nude tour was very successful, hugely successful, because at that time, he hadn't toured for a bit. He'd been off the road for a couple of years. So that was very successful. When Prince went to Minneapolis. He came back to Los Angeles. He had me meet him at a hotel. We still hadn't been intimate. He said, Kim Basinger is at my house in Minneapolis. She asked me to marry her tonight. And I said, what? What was your answer? He said, I laughed at her. I got on a plane and I came and got you. Print that I can't marry her. And I said, why? She's beautiful. This is what he said next. She has wrinkly knees. I found out later that they got into some sort of a fight and then she left. They broke up. He went back home to Minneapolis. I got a phone call about a week later. Prince called me back. Hello. And he said, are you ready? And I said, ready for what? And he said, to move to Minneapolis. And I was like, what? He said, I would like to work with you. I would like you to move to Minneapolis. Are you ready? And I said, yes. My part did not exist. And then he wrote me into Graffiti Bridge. I got paid $2,000 a week. 98% of the time I slept at his house. Well, he asked everybody to be something in that film. And whoever said yes got picked. I know Graffiti Bridge didn't do that well as a movie, but Prince had explained it to me. People were expecting Purple Rain. They weren't expecting an actual vision from Prince. Yeah. All Prince was doing was kind of taking off with that story and showing a different perspective. Spiritual beliefs of angels making sacrifices to bring two different types of power, opposing powers, together. It was kind of obvious to know which were her ideas as opposed to what we were going to get. What they had before was so much better and richer. Kim Basinger and Prince had written a script. I thought that it would have been a very elevated, almost like a Vim Vendors concept with the angels, the dark right. and the light concept. I thought that his stupidity was the reason that he it up basically so yeah i was really pissed off about it very very much so well of course prince was extremely professional so prince was everywhere you had to be on set at like 5 30 in the morning for makeup and then they would do your makeup you would go to your trailer you would relax until they called you on the set a lot of people did not like the sets that it wasn't real Mm -hmm. And Purple Rain was shot. It was real. Everything was real. After watching it, you get the feeling when Prince got bored with editing it. Man, you know, boy, she's out of there. Ambulance came, took her right off. So that's how his mind worked, too. Like, OK, move it right along. A lot of stuff got lost mm -hmm. in the editing, of the flow of where the movie was supposed to be going. He was inviting me to the film mix session. I thought it was terrible. Uh, Prince kind of needed people talking the truth to him, and it was a risky thing to do. No, I never said, this is a terrible movie. You know, Prince kind of lived in this bubble. As the movie got closer to being done, they were starting to edit it in LA. So I was out there for months. I kind of wanted to say out loud, like, this is terrible, right? Like, how can we fix this? Every now and then I, you know, introduce him to females in Los Angeles. And, and then he met Carmen Electra through me. And music and dance was always my goal. Dance is my number one passion. When I ended up leaving Cincinnati and just on a visit, just on a very quick visit to Los Angeles. And then within that time, I ended up meeting Prince. I was doing an album project with Prince. I did quite a few songs. Prince came to me and said, I want you to put together a band. And Prince says, would you like to scout, you know, for your band? That's a great idea. I'm going to do that. Just the first time I met him, I was auditioning for an all-girl band that he was putting together at the time. We, we basically are sneaking into different nightclubs here in L.A. I walk in this one nightclub and there's this girl. She's really ad adorable, really pretty. And this woman approached me. At first I thought she was, because she, she was staring at me. 
I want to go talk to this girl. And I walk up to her and I say, excuse me, what's your name? Tara. Yeah, she, she approached me and she said, I have an all-girl band that I'm producing <gasps> with Prince. I'm, I'm putting an all-girl band together. Um, it's my band. I'm the lead. And I'm looking for girls to be in the band. I think you're a really good dancer. And I'd love to have you in my band and meet Prince and basically audition oh my for God. the band. I said... How old are you? She said, 18. Where are you from? Cincinnati, Ohio. How long have you been here? For two weeks. Can you rap, sing, dance? Can you do any motherfucking thing? <laughs> I, can, I can dance. I'm a professionally trained dancer, but I can rap. But I, uh, but I love dancing. And Would you be willing to meet Prince and audition to be in my band? And Robin Power and the Uptown Dames. Tara Patrick trusted me. You know, you hear stories about, like, L.A. A blue BMW pulls up. Mm. And so I'm like, okay, that seems very Prince-like. <laughs> you know, I can imagine him in a blue BMW. And we just took a chance and we went to his house. Oh, my God. I was like, okay, well, maybe this is real. Like, I was a huge fan of um, the Love Sexy Tour and Sign of the Times. He had a dancer that performed with him, and her name's Kat. I, I really loved her style. So anyway, anyway, we go, we we go like up, we're going up into the hills, and um, we get there, and he's standing in the doorway, and he's making like sort of a sexy face, but like it was scary to me. I really just wanted to work. Basically, had a week to figure it out. He got on the piano, and he goes, "Do you sing?" And I said, "Yeah." He uh, he wanted me to dance, to to see me dance. So Prince got on the piano. He was like, "So she could sing?" I said, "I don't know." And she is dope. I saw her giving Paula Abdul a run for her money. Then he asked her, can she rap? And she raps. And he kind of giggles a little bit. He played music from, from that movie that he was about to premiere. Total freestyle, total freestyle. He was very quiet and didn't say anything. He wouldn't say yes or no. Oh my God, I sucked. <laughs> I really sucked, I blew it. Like he said, give me a minute. And then he pulls me aside. No, I don't think you should put her in the band. Why? She can't sing, she can dance, she can rap a little bit, but she does sound like a white girl. You never want to put somebody in your band that could possibly outshine you. And so he was talking with this woman that, that had the band. And so I, I went downstairs and I'm just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. I'm like, oh, please, please, I really want to be in her band. And she kept walking down. She's like, he's not, he won't give me an answer. It felt weird. So I'm in bed with Prince. We're watching a movie. Prince says, why don't you ask her if she wants to come and watch a movie with us? And I'm like, uh-oh, I just was not going to do that. I wrote her a note and I slipped it under the, under the door and she said, no. It was getting late. And then so I was like, okay, um, I'm like, can Wilmo take me back? The driver was gone. And so I spent the night like in, downstairs, like what? in the guest room. And I was so scared. And, but you know, everything was fine. So I'm going to respect that. The limo um, took us back and I told her in the limo, I think you're beautiful. I think you can dance. I think you're talented. I like that you can rap. I said, look, I said, Prince told me not to put you in my band. Um, I didn't end up making it into the band. So I was really, I was really bummed about that. I am Robin Power. And I'm Inga Chavez. It's sort of like a 1950s rock and roll musical. There's Morris and the Kid again, and they're sort of battling over the ownership of one of the clubs. The Kid's place is called Glam Slam. Morris's club is called Pandemonium. The Kid makes a bet with Morris Day. Whoever writes the better song gets the deed to the other guy's nightclub. I play a character who comes in to sort of settle the score between the two. I play Morris's girlfriend, and uh -huh. I'm trying to keep him away from her. This is how I settle my score. I'm a bad sister. So Morris is after movie. you. Mm -hmm. and she's okay. not having and, it. And of course, Watch the out kid. Watch quiet ones now. That's right. I know. <laughs> that the kid Prince is after you okay, also. Okay, so mm -hmm. you know what we better do now? We better watch Graffiti Bridge. I was there, I was sitting next to Prince in the theater 
at the premiere. Prince got up and left before the movie ended, like he always did for every movie. Instead of like the clapping that he got from Purple Rain, people were a little more silent. As we discovered at the opening of his latest movie, Graffiti Bridge, even his co-stars can't get enough of Mr. Mystique. He's my idol. So this is like a dream country for me. I have loved Prince since I was 13 years old, from sleeping outside the Prince concert tickets to uh, making sure I have to have front row seats. So this is like bigger than life for me. I turned 17 in November 1990, just before the opening of Prince's movie, Graffiti Bridge. General H. H. Arnold High were showing Graffiti Bridge. I'll get to see it, I told my dear friend on the phone. I'm super excited. The night it came out, he was like, we made a million bucks tonight. And I was like, you know, nodding and smiling and, and yay. And I knew that was the last dollar we were going to make off Graffiti Bridge. Prince, the enigmatic and elusive king of punk rock, was in New York last week for the world premiere of his fourth movie, Graffiti Bridge, a movie he wrote, directed, and stars in. Purple Rain was so huge that everybody and their mama was at the Graffiti Bridge premiere. They all were there, from Wesley Snipes. He's like our modern day Mozart. On down to Lenny Kravitz. The night of the premiere of Graffiti Bridge, he knew that I was there. Lenny came, had me come out to his car, and that's when he told me basically that Madonna was gonna do it. He talked me into not taking credit for it. I just felt a little bit cornered about the whole deal. I didn't have a lawyer, I didn't have management at the time, so. Craig Rice had heard the original. You are the only person who's ever heard the original version mm -hmm. of Justify My Love. Justify My Love, which she recorded. I thought it was a brilliant piece of work. A singer and actress, Ingrid Chavez, claimed that she originally wrote Justify My Love for Madonna and recorded it with Lenny Kravitz in Los Angeles last summer. But there has been a further twist to the tale. Lenny Kravitz has responded to the claim by Graffiti Bridge star Ingrid Chavez, saying that Chavez did write some lyrics for the song and that he signed an agreement with her, giving her 25% of the composer's royalties. However, for undisclosed personal reasons, the agreement also stipulated that Kravitz would get sole writer's credit. I didn't tell Prince because I was actually wasn't supposed to tell anybody that I wrote the song because I kind of got myself into a situation with Lenny. He did give me something, but it wasn't credit. You know? Can you catch any heat from Lisa? So, no, no, no. She and I are cool. We know it's. Well, I'm single again. That was a big change. The last two years have been sort of a recovery period, spending time with my kid. Yeah. Do you and the baby hang out with Mr. Kravitz and spend time together, the three of you, every now and then? <laughs> I haven't really seen anyone in a long time. You know, I just have gone through lots of changes. So. Who are you dating now, Lanny? Before uh, we get to the music, who are you dating now? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a single guy. It's my brother. I don't do, I don't. Yeah, you don't do. Uh, yeah, that's what Lisa found out. You don't do. Yeah, honey. Okay, I'll tell you what. Then why don't you just look at these divorce papers I'm issuing to you? <laughs> why don't you go look at a different apartment? <laughs> Lenny was involved for a while with this woman who was, I think, Hispanic. Yeah. And then she was the woman that was sort of involved with Madonna. Oh, yo, oh Ingrid whoa. Chavez? Who the hell That's is Baba this? That's Baba Booey. You guys know. <laughs> see, uh, uh, Ingrid Chavez. Well, you worked with Madonna on that song. Yes, ma'am. Is that where you met her? <laughs> How long do you generally stay with these girls? What's the average? Like well, a month? About five minutes. About five minutes is right. Well, it was a nasty battle. It was playing out on, you know, MTV, you know, like statements that going back between me and Lenny, and it was really just ugly. That was when I hired a lawyer. Oh, I took Lenny to court because he had most of the copyright on it and the publishing, songwriting credit and everything. Madonna changed one line. She got 10% got credit for it. My name is on the record now as a writer and I own part of the publishing. Critics universally panned Graffiti Bridge. Purple Rain had so much energy, so much passion, so much conviction. Those are three qualities that are lacking here. When I said to Prince, on page 10, you're walking home, your father's going to turn and belt you across the face. Are you ready? He looked at me, and he knew this was serious, and he said, yeah, I'm ready. Graffiti Bridge is quite awful, an extended music video. The style on MTV would never translate to motion picture because it doesn't have a narrative thrust. Prince plays a character called The Kid, modeled after his character in his first movie, Purple Rain. The dialogue is so awkward and stilted, and the woman we saw in the reaction shot there, she has an empty role. There's two ways to make films. You can make them for 10 people, or you can really try to learn how to make the same subject matter accessible to a wider group of people. There's a whole lot I can't 
can't believe about Graffiti Bridge. The spirituality battle is lame. Prince is not the least bit appealing when he isn't singing. It wasn't the subject matter. It was the accessibility of the main character that was of primary importance. And one thing this movie doesn't have from beginning to end is an electrifying song and band no, one. sequence that really takes off and carries you with it. It's a real flat, low-energy film. In the case of Purple Rain, Michelle Columbier, extremely, extremely talented individuals, both tremendously um, open to the collaborative process and both tremendously anxious to weave their music with the song score and have the song score weave into their music, you end up with, you know, that third dimension. He didn't call me every day, but we spoke on the phone several times most weeks. Prince asked me if I'd seen it. At the midnight showing on Homecoming Night, my classmate's response to Graffiti Bridge, I found myself sinking deeper into my seat. It broke my heart. I sat there on the phone, not wanting to say anything that would hurt him. I'm sorry. They just didn't get it. Nah, it's okay. You can't look at yourself through other people's eyes. When you're working at a certain level, you find that people live through you. And if you don't act like they expect you to, then you're the bad one. I knew what he was hearing back in the States must be magnified a million times over. I didn't really see the movie because that movie was gone out of the theaters probably the next day. Prince liked it. It was Prince's project, and that was that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He didn't wallow in it. He was already on to the next project. Yeah, we, we kind of got past that in a hurry. There's a conversation that we had alone in Studio A, and I don't recall how we got on the subject, but I'll never forget what he said. He held up a copy of Billboard's Hot 100, and Hammer and Vanilla Ice both had hits at the time. Baby. Oh, stop. Break it down. Huge hits. And he pointed to the chart and he said, do you know what it feels like to spend your whole life learning a craft? Look at this and see Hammer and Vanilla Ice who cannot sing and cannot play an instrument and I can't get in the top 20. You know, there was a point where you can't beat him, join him. Now, all of a sudden, it's not his day anymore. There's new kids on the block. Bad, bad pun. 